So Joy Guru, welcome to yet another interaction of our online Baul Akhara. And uh, we are here from Ektara Kalari and specifically our Sanatan Sitashram of Birbhum. Uh, Ektara Kalari is a not-for-profit organization that aspires to serve ancient Indian traditions and their practitioners. Ektara Kalari's flagship program is uh, Sanatan Siddhashram, which is located in Birbhum, West Bengal, the red soiled uh, land of Birbhum, which focuses on strengthening the practice of Baal tradition in the modern times. Sanatan Siddhashram is essentially a learning space and the space of Saraswati Devi. This effort is envisioned and led by Srimati Parvati Baul Argu. Through its online forum, Online Baul Akhara, it enables interaction with spiritual masters and sadhakas of diverse paths with a special emphasis to bring forth the practitioner's perspective of the spiritual tradition. So today's event, which is the Ishta Dhyana, is one such interaction between two sadhakas uh, who will discuss about Ishta Devata Upasana which is a profound and unique connection with the deity for an individual's spiritual journey that has been explored to the fullest in Hindu religious thought. So just to introduce our two speakers and uh, conversationalists of the day, uh, our first guest invited member is Sri Rajarshi Nandi. Welcome, Joy Guru. Sri Rajarshi Nandi is a sadhaka whose path is associated with the Tantric Upasana of the Divine Mother. He is also a author and columnist of several topics related to Indian religious and spiritual thought. He has helped co-author a paper exploring the links between Tantra and modern neuroscience, which was published in Neurology India. And he manages a popular Facebook page on Hindu spirituality named Adhyatmikata. And our respondent conversationalist, uh, our very own Sanatan Siddhashram's Sri Ramchandra Roddam. And uh, Sri Ramchandra Roddam is a sadhaka of the Divine Mother. Uh, he is an invited faculty who teaches on Indian spirituality, yoga, and sadhana in different, different places. He is the author of the book Devi Bhakti Tarangini, which is a devotional offering of English poems he's written to the Supreme Goddess. Currently, he is rendering seva at the Sanatan Siddhashram, where he's logged in from. So, with all that introduction and auspicious, auspicious pranams to Devi, I welcome everybody and hand over to Ram Dada, thank you. Jai Guru, uh, Dhanavad Puja, and uh, we welcome all who have already arrived. I think there will be few more who will be arriving. Um, so at the outset, and you know, I would like to state few details about this conversation, how this is likely to go. So we have uh, earmarked about one hour, 15 minutes approximately for this conversation, but uh, we, we will decide how it goes and it might even stretch beyond that. So just be patient, be open and also feel totally free if you have to, uh, if you have other commitments and you want to catch up. This particular recording will be uploaded on our own online Akhira, which is an online learning center. And uh, you can always access it now that you have registered for this talk. Um, beyond that, uh, I think Puja has mentioned uh, beautifully that I am I am right now connected from Sanatan Siddhashram, which is located in Birbhum, and our uh, dear guest uh, Rajarshi uh, has been to Birbhum <laughs> in the past, yeah. and I think. I, uh, if I'm right, Rajarshi, you have some of your early uh, sadhana connections also to Birbhum, apart from your own childhood memories. Yes. Yeah. So I would, uh, 
I think with his permission, I'll take few minutes of reflection on Birbhum itself. You know, I have sure. I have had an opportunity. So I am from southern part of India. So I'm from basically from Hyderabad, right? And uh, so um, I had an opportunity by uh, virtue of doing this seva to the Baul Gurus and the vision of our Param Guru, Sri Sanatan Das Baul, who has given us a purpose and a goal uh, to embark on, uh, to take forward the mission of the Baul tradition. And we do this under the guidance and visionary leadership of Srimati Parvati Baul. And uh, I have made several visits to Birbhum. And Birbhum is the most appropriate uh, place, I think, for me personally, that I'm here, uh, that we are having this conversation. It is a place of five Shakti Pitas. And then I think we can call technically two additional Siddha Pitas, you know, which would be Tarapit. And Tarapit is not a Shakti Pit, it is referred to as Siddha Pit. And we will probably learn from Rajashi what could be the difference <laughs> in calling it so. And uh, and Bakreshwar, and these are two very powerful pitas, you know, that come. And this is filled with uh, not only Ganges is not very far from here, and Ma Ganga is flowing very close by, and there are many other rivers. What these rivers do is give a very fantastic formations of the topography, which is filled with Kurma Prushti, you know, a tortoise shaped lands the upward movements of the waters, all of this sets forth a brilliant space, a fertile soil for the Tantra Upasana. If you take any of the ancient scriptures and refer to the Tantras, I mean, they would even refer to these, spe you know, these specialized topographies, uh, which would enhance your sadhana. And uh, not to mention that you have the greatest number of cremation grounds in and around that space, you know, to even enhance even further the deeper and the more fierce sadhana aspects. Um, so that is about Birbhu and, uh, and, and it is all the more auspicious that we are just a day away from Saraswati Puja, which is extremely important in, the, in this region of India, that is just tomorrow. And we are in the middle of uh, what we would call Gupta Navaratri, again, nine sacred days for the Divine Mother. And we invoke especially uh, Tripura, Mother Tripura, uh, or Tripura Sundari, or Sri Lalita Tripura Sundari, uh, whom we could refer to as, as these these specific days are all the more important to her, like how Ma Durga would have, you know, specifically the Sharadiya Navaratri in September, October. So with all such auspiciousness surrounded, I think we should just commence this without any further delay. And I would like uh, Rajarshi to reflect a little bit about Birbhum and you know, throw some light on his own reflections on it because he has a personal connection to this space. Namaste to everybody. Uh, I hope I'm audible and clear. Yes. Yeah. So as you rightly pointed out, Birbhum is, uh, in my opinion, uh, perhaps, uh, in fact, it's possibly one of the most powerful, one of the most charged areas in anywhere in India, I mean, leaving Himalaya aside, Himalaya is a different zone altogether. But if you come down from the Himalayas and the plain, you would really find a place that is so absolutely suited for spiritual practices of a certain uh, nature, specifically related to the Divine Mother, which we call the path of uh, Tantra Sadhana or Shakti Pasana. And it's not just one particular place, the whole area of Birbhum, as you mentioned, there are five Shakti Vitas. There are two Siddha Peters, and there are innumerable small places which are not even famous. I mean, these are like the, you know, what do you call it, the, the landmark areas in Birbhum. Uh, if you go into older texts which describe these uh, five Peters, each of these are, some of the other form of Shakti is there, but not just the presence of the mother, but each of them have their own unique characteristics, unique nature. So I wanted to, I think, in order to take this conversation forward, mm. and I think more mm. than more than anything else, one of why, why, it is very beautiful to have Rajarshi with us for this conversation is because he would always tell us, you know, some of his friends that he is a lateral entry into sadhana space. He is not somebody who has been brought up from a very, uh, you know, fam a, a familiar environment of uh, piety yes. and worship and all of that. And he's sort of a lateral entry and he came in between, he figured out. And there is a healthy dose of skepticism, I think, which is very essential for all sadhakas that we get to see how Rajarshi maneuvers that. And this is my personal experience. So I would like to, you know, Rajarshi to share his personal journey into the realms of sadhana. From there, we will take this discussion forward. All right. So uh, 
yeah as you mentioned initially i mean for a long period of time actually till my college days at least i had absolutely zero interest in these things uh, got nothing to do with uh, religion per se and just life is going on as normal uh, normal means as it happens with anybody for that matter and uh, i come from a moderate religious background moderate religious means as you would say an average uh, middle class religiosity that's about it not too much not too less the standard uh, you know uh, some festivals at home and things like that but uh, i personally had zero interest in it never uh, would i i can't recall myself uh, you know actually sitting through any of the pujas uh, ever i used to feel bored and it made no sense to me uh, durga puja was of course always big because being a bengali doesn't matter uh, you know what is your uh, orientation religious orientation whether you're an atheist or a believer or anything you enjoy durga puja that's there <coughs> the things were going on like this then um, during my college days i did have uh, uh, there was a rough phase i was passing through because of various issues uh, there i had once uh, i was going with a couple of my friends and not friends exactly huh? friends and relatives yes and i had visited a uh durga puja pandal in during the tithi saptami tithi which is uh, you know one of the key uh, tithis during durga puja 6 7 8 9 and 10th vijaya dashami that happens and uh, i remember i was standing in front and there were people around and suddenly i was looking at the deity and i could uh, for a very brief period of time for a few seconds suddenly it felt as if everything all the sounds uh, everything was cut off there was nothing in front and i could see the deity and it was not it was not uh, vigraha it was not a pratima it was somebody who was alive and those eyes were completely uh, the flesh and blood if i may put it that way but it's much more real than that and this whole thing happened for a few fraction of seconds i mean the experience must have been for a few seconds not more than that and uh, i remember during that during that moment um there was very organically there were few two things that i had asked i mean i still couldn't figure out at the time that why did i ask something uh, one was that i i was curious to see when it, basically that if there is any truth in these things that was one of the first thing i had asked to the goddess i i in fact did not know at that time what was happening because it was not these things don't happen uh, using your rational mind basically your rational mind has to be transcended in a specific moment whether you do it through sadhana or whether it happens organically spontaneously or something like that uh, rational mind can't properly comprehend or even adjust to these changed realities all of a sudden so i remember i'd asked two things specifically and after that again a few seconds later i could hear all the commotion and all the sounds and everything and it was back to normal and i even was uh, you know wondering what exactly happened i i put it down as perhaps some uh delusion of the mind or something like that i didn't pay much heed to it i didn't even discuss this with anybody and i came back home and uh, after a few days the puja got over and i was sitting with one of my friends in the hostel room and we were just chatting like this suddenly his uncle calls me uh, his uncle calls up this friend of mine and he was he was not just was he still is one of the most uh, exceptional tantrik upasakas of the divine mother i have encountered till date is very very higher extremely higher so he calls up this friend of mine and i'm sitting there in his room and after few conversation he suddenly tells this friend that uh, is there anybody else with you in the room and he says that i have a friend here so he says could you pass the phone to him so he passes the phone to me and i really don't know what to speak and why would i even speak i mean i just said uh, you know blurted out a namaste and uh, he told me i i could just hear like you know one line he said suddenly that i'll be coming to your uh, i was in bangalore at that time i'll be coming to bangalore for some office work uh, why don't you come and meet me once so after that he comes there i go to meet him that was a life changing meeting he was dressed like any other normal individual and all that and everything yeah, but within 10 15 minutes as i keep speaking to him i suddenly realize that he's telling me things that Uh, even my closest friends are not aware of i mean uh, such uh, it's as if he's just reading everything that is there in my mind everything that has happened before everything that is going on and after some time i thought maybe this is you know some kind of mind reading or some 
uh, you are able to hear me right ram yeah yeah we can hear we can hear we can hear okay right. i think it's only so, few uh, people so you go ahead yeah we will let you know yeah so so that was a very crucial meeting uh, i had with him where meeting means initially i remember when i sat with him after a few sometime i figured out that he is actually speaking things pretty much whatever is going on in my mind and things that have happened with me some time ago and i thought maybe there's some kind of a trick maybe this is mind reading maybe this is who knows hypnosis or this or that i mean i was simply not ready to believe that anything is possible beyond the five senses uh, but then he predicted few things ki this 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 is going to happen in coming times and i saw that uh, things actually turned out pretty much exactly how he told me and i also got curious that how does this go ahead from here uh, because this is something i felt very attracted to that if there is a possibility of something happening which is not a trick but which transcends the five senses which is not explainable by normal logic then i'm interested to know whether it is true and if it is true how exactly does somebody do it that was my starting point so he told me that uh, you know he gave me i remember he wrote down a mantra and said that you keep chanting this uh, i had no clue even of the deity who was uh, whose mantra it was at that time because i never heard the name before so i just uh, remember remember i kept doing it for uh, uh, months and months i'm doing there's nothing happening uh, meanwhile though uh, i always was a very voracious reader so any topic you give me i was always curious to know what is there at least a brief gist of the ideas i can get i won't be an expert in it but it will be good enough to hold a conversation in that topic uh, provided it was not something to do with my actual studies which i was supposed to do which i had very little interest <laughs> in at that time so i I remember I used to go to the Bangalore Ramakrishna Mission and I picked up books on Advaita and I read them and they were very nice. I mean, at least that at the surface level you can get the idea. It's not that complicated. I'm not saying you will go to the depth of the you know all the tattvas and everything. Uh, but uh, to be honest, it was this strangeness that there is something, there is a possibility beyond the five senses. There's something else. Whatever be the explanation, whether there is a deity, whether it is a power of your mind, whether it's something else. Uh, that was what first attracted me to this path so i remember after doing uh, japa for close to a year i mean i used to do that only one thing everything else was going on normally in life but uh, i used to figure out time and sit and do one mala of that mantra and it was a pretty long one and it used to take me close to an hour to finish that one mala i remember uh, so that was like sort of a set discipline that whatever happens i will do that one mala and uh, i remember even with friends and all on weekends you know we used to go out and things like that so they would come and tell me ki chalo let's go and i would be like yeah i'll join you give me an hour i'll finish this and then i'll go but uh, after I remember after 5 6 months there was nothing it was just chanting and all that and one day it suddenly struck me that what is the point in doing all this there has to be some benefit there has to be some effect i need to see something i mean i cannot put my faith on a transaction where you are supposed to get something fantastic 100 years later in your next life and all that i might as well use that time for something fruitful that i can you know tangibly enjoy at that time so that was my thinking process so i called him up one day and told him that uh, you know uh, that mai to kar raha hu ye lekin kuch to ho nahi raha nothing is happening so he said what what do you want to happen what what is it that you are expecting i said i don't know something light sound kuch to hona chahiye something has to be there i know how do you how do i know that i am doing it right or if this at all leads to anything so that time he uh, gave me a very crucial advice first lesson for me he said that no now do the same thing but taking a sankalpa so he told me how to do the sankalpa what rules to follow he said for 40 days you do it and i took a 40 day sankalpa of that mantra that i will do it at the same time same place certain other rules and restrictions that i added uh, maintaining you know food restrictions and things like that not too major but small ones even for me at that time that itself was a big deal even you know uh, introducing that amount of little bit amount of discipline into the process was a big deal so i finished 40 days of that japa and 41st day i remember i am like uh, it was a sunday and i 
go out in the morning with my friends to have some coffee and suddenly i see there is like a uh, a group of vehicles coming from the other side of the road six seven eight vehicles and all of them had the name of this deity uh, mentioned on the screen right at the beginning like a poster and the other thing was that this is not a deity who's that popular in that part of india by the way so it is not like uh, you know, if you go to Tirupati and you see 100 cars written, uh, you know, with the name of Tirupati, it's not a miracle. It's a coincidence. It's, it's, it's expected. This was unexpected. When I saw the first vehicle and the second vehicle, I remember I thought it's yeah, just a coincidence. When the eighth and the ninth vehicle passed in front of me with the name of the deity, then I thought uh, something is happening, but I'm not sure what exactly is happening. That night, I finished my japa and I remember I was like lying down in the bed and uh, it's pretty late, 2, 2.30ish, I think. Suddenly I felt uh, I had an experience of the deity. It was, the deity was present close by and I could see with my physical eyes and I got damn scared. That is the honest reaction. And we have this fantastic idea at the initial stages, you know, that uh, a date is very nice, we'll give you one flower and something like that, you'll be very happy. But the honest to God truth of these things is that you're not, the reason you need to do sadhana is because your nervous system does not have the power to take the energy of a deity if it were to appear right in front suddenly. So that is why you are trying to rebuild yourself into a more stable condition where you can take even a fraction of that energy. So I, I recall, I uh, that was sort of a very interesting experience. I still remember that. And next day I called him up, uh, that gentleman whom, who's one of my gurus actually. I called him up and uh, told him that I had these things happen. And um, uh, he was uh, he was like, uh, it's not a big deal. It's fine. Nothing to worry. If you're feeling scared, then go and stay with your fr some friend's house for two, three days and come back. Just kind of downplayed the whole thing. So I I initially stopped, I mean, after that experience, I remember I stopped doing the japa because it took me some time to process, okay, what is it that I was seeing? And the interesting part was that not only me, at the, in the house, uh, there was another friend of mine. He had no idea that I was doing anything like this. And um, he sensed that there was something very odd, something very strange in the room that night. He, he got up from his bed at precisely that point of time, but he couldn't see anything. He felt there was something something different. And I remember later he told me that, you know, uh, this, what was something was going on at night, last night, something weird, strange. I felt, did you see anything? Was there anybody, uh, did anybody come into the room? I said, no, nothing like that. I, I didn't, you know, sort of go ahead with the conversation, extend the conversation. So that's perhaps, uh, that experience was both a kind of a reality check for me as well as, uh, you know, uh, an inspiration to go ahead. Because after a few days, I felt that, I felt that deep urge to again restart and see that where exactly it goes, this thing. Why, how, you know, where exactly, how far it can be taken. So that's how, you know, in a way that sort of inspired me to still carry on and see that, you know, if you push it even harder, if you go even deeper, then where does this lead to? So that's how it started off. That's that's thanks a lot for sharing that uh, and you know setting the base because it was your narrative was almost like a big river with setting of too many tributaries. I don't know which one mm. to catch and which direction to go, <laughs> uh, but but I would I would probably uh, latch on to the last part what you have said and which is said yeah. that is what set me <coughs> to know more what exactly this is. Now mm. when we pursue. Uh, with mm. such a clear idea that okay, I need to make sense of what this what's happening here, and I want to understand this more. Mm. Many things can happen for a seeker at this juncture where you stood, you know, at this point in time. One of the things that is likely to happen, likely to happen, mm. more likely to happen for most of us is that we somehow end up into a cycle and a rhythm of comparative analysis of which path is better what is highest is this is this seeking even worth it or is there a bigger goal than trying to identify this experience and usually things land up at the doorstep of the absolute truth 
and one need not uh, have these connections or need not re rely on uh, probably what we refer to as the deities and the gods and all of that but something more you know there is also this phrase of embodied experience and you know, all this you know that something happens within us and all of that so uh, to put it in a much more simpler way was there a conflict in your seeking from here on somewhere it arrived that oh should i take a nirguna path and you know, a path of impersonal pursuit of the deities and um, or the godhead or absolute self or the brahman or should i continue and you know pursue this uh, you know truth that what i have experienced you know how did how did you na first of all a conflict like this ever arise in your mind did you discover the, did it happen to you if it did how did you navigate it and if you did not navigate it at all and there was no conflict at all then fantastic then how to arrive at such a clarity so so uh, well largely i did not face this kind of a problem why that is because as i told you initially i mean uh, at the level of the mind i could fairly understand that okay this is something there is something called the nirguna and there is something called the saguna upasana there is a form there are deities and then there is the the call it the brahman or this or whatever term you you want to use that that is completely uh, without any attributes etc but that understanding was at the level of the mind and uh, honestly i felt no specific attraction for that because uh, the reason i did not feel is that i could understand what they are trying to say but at the same time most of the people whom i had interacted with so it's uh my attraction for this is always based on uh, exploring new experiences what is it that is beyond the five senses that is the starting point i am not interested i was not interested to be honest in a very transcendental deity outside of the world exceptionally powerful the you know whatever it is call it god or this or that etc i my philosophy of looking towards these things is that suppose there is something suppose there is a infinitely powerful being Uh, why exactly would it be interested in me, and why should I be interested in that? As answer me that. I mean, I am interested in the reality that I exist in, in the five, you know, things around me, in the world that I am in. That is where I'm interested in. That is where I need to find out those spaces which are, uh, you know, uh, call it mysterious, call it beautiful, call it that points where the rational mind fails to understand. And I'm not talking about something that is far up in the sky somewhere. No. around me here in this present present reality that is there around me so that kind of a thing when it translated into reality what happened was when i met with uh, so i did interact with a lot after i got uh, you know this sort of initial introduction into this path as i call it a lateral entry because i had no interest and then i got pulled into it i met with various people upasakas uh, some saints sadhus i used to you know somebody i i started taking an interest in these things so somebody there was a lecture going on something i would attend that most of the people maybe this is my experience but then this is my reality so almost not just most let me put it this way almost every single individual whom i found who said that he worship he or she worship the nirguna i found absolutely any no trace of spiritual genuine spirituality in them at that moment the reason being that it was all at the mental level so there is a fantastic amount of theory in the head so, you know various technical terms and this and that you go beyond this you go there you go there all that is there but suppose you actually enter into the this this thing which we call uh, nirguna or or sarvaguna or whatever or brahman or anything that is it is so completely detached so completely detached that if you were to enter into its atmosphere it's like uh, your worship of that is not a normal worship either you can enter there or you cannot enter there that's about it there is no striving there is no okay i will go there tomorrow i will reach there 10 days later if you are not able to reach it right now right at this very moment then you are not going to reach there tomorrow i this sounds very drastic this sounds very very drastic but this is exactly the reality of that thing either you are there at this moment or you are not there if you are not there then you are only living in your imagination okay i will go there i am worshiping something why why do you think that thing even cares about you or anybody for that matter it has no sides it takes it is absolutely neutral that is its beauty and that is why very loosely put the hindu religion and i suppose it can be extended to various other uh, you know classical religions that used to exist 
So they had this concept of this one absolute supreme entity. But the supreme entity takes no sides. You cannot worship it. So Hindus never made a temple to the Brahman. Hindus never made a temple to the self. It is only at the last stage, the sannyasi who has renounced this world, you enter into that when you are effectively, truly, honestly, in a non-delusional way, ready to renounce the world. I remember this non-delusional term because very often we think in our head that we want this, we will go there, etc. But at the same time, there is the slightest amount of disturbance in our atmosphere. Somebody is not talking to you. Some office problem is going on, etc. Immediately your mind gets stuck there. That effectively means that your mind and body is not even ready to enter into the atmosphere of that entity, that being, that self, that Brahman, whatever you call it. This is the honest truth of this thing. So what happened effectively is that when I used to now what I'm saying right now is the understanding I have at but I had a very organic sense that the people whom uh, who were whom I interacted with who were worshippers of the self uh, I did not find them that impressive so that's precisely why I never felt any attraction towards that I felt a more greater attraction towards understanding the deities right so okay so i mean there are there is something that is very essential that uh, you know i could gather from this explanation or this sharing is that i think this is also applicable to whatever the path one seeks through is that always start from where one's experience stands rather than trying to think about i want that so therefore i am already there and always mm. discounting your current state of your true reality and discounting mm. this as something lesser mm. and trying to give more value mm. to something that you actually aspire for and mm. this sort of creates a gap and you know mm. people fall with a lot of delusions you know? so <coughs> is is that is yeah. that something that you think that no th that is of course there that is there in the sense that yes th that applies to all paths that's absolutely right uh, that we must free ourselves from as far as possible. The first rule is that be honest to yourself. And by honesty, it means that not verbal mental honesty. So there is, you know, you have the four levels of speech. And the fourth, the one we use to communicate with others, the externalized speech is also the area, also the domain where we create lies. And the biggest lies are the ones we tell ourselves. So I want to be very spiritual, I want to be this, but I also want a very good bank balance, I want to become a very popular individual, I want to do this, that, etc. So there are various conflicting ideas inside, deep inside. So nature takes into account all these ideas, and the greatest driving desire is where you will eventually land up. So it does not matter from morning to evening if you give 10 lectures on spirituality, but deep down your chief worry is that, how do I increase my, uh, you know, something else, whatever. And there's nothing wrong in being materialistic. Absolutely fine. And we have uh, all the four segments that the rishis had given us. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. You can choose anyone. There's nothing illegitimate in that so long as you are not cheating anybody. But the honesty has to be there that where exactly do you really want to go? If you want to progress in sadhana, and that goes even for sadhana with respect to deities. If you go into the higher zones of it, you will realize that there is going to be a moment of complete reckoning inside, a moment where you have to sort of decide that is it, how far do you want to go? Is it really meant for you or is there is, you know, okay, I, this much is fine, the rest I want to also enjoy with um, life as, you know, other things are going on. So that understanding nobody can give you, no guru can give you, no book can give you, no scripture can give you, that maturity has to come from within. And only those individuals who are absolutely brutally honest with themselves have a scope of reaching the deity. And that too may not be in one lifetime, by the way. If you see somebody who has actually, for example, uh, I used to wonder sometimes that I've, I have uh, more than one gurus and they're all fantastic. So sometimes I used to see them do fantastic, many exceptional things. And I used to wonder that how is that possible? But then it came, I realized that that's because they have done all the hard work in past lives. So there is nobody who's going to get something that for which they have not worked for. There is no lottery in this system. There's not like, you know, randomly pick up a chit and whose name comes up, that person gets, enters into the, you know, thing, not like that. Coming to the aspect of the Nirguna Upasana, Nirguna Upasana is actually not, in my opinion, is not fit for most people. It is much better for them to have a formed worship and let the deity take you to where you need to go. Because you are like, 
uh, assuming that you can enter into the nirguna is like you are a, a student who has just entered play school okay not even nursery and class one play school and he is thinking that i will tomorrow get a nobel prize in physics that the gap is so huge the gap is that huge literally that huge so maybe you know one in crores and millions and billions of people there may be one individual of that caliber who can directly enter into the nirguna it's very good for him but others what usually happens is they will create a elaborate mental configuration that i am entering into the self entering into the brahman when the reality is entirely different so that gap exists because there is some amount of delusion inside delusion is so not truth, in a very yeah the truth telling to oneself you know that is yeah, exactly. the priority and so uh, i know uh, i think this would be i want i want to know that now that you you when you tread this path in the initial mm. days were there any inspiring mm. figures that you found that you said like for instance you know not very far from here we hear the stories of bama kerma you know mm. and and his was a complete relationship with mother divine mother tara and and of course not very far from here the contemporary of bama kepa we have shri ramakrishna paramahamsa uh, yes. whose relationship even mm. despite uh, attestations from the greatest of the advaitic masters you know he said that i find the brahman in my mother kali right mm -hmm. so is it is there something that really because you especially also have a very deep uh, sadhana element uh, to you mm -hmm. so were there any inspiring figures that you came across in your readings in your seeking that you could share yes uh, at least few of them i deeply uh, i remain deeply indebted to one is sri aurobindo though his path is entirely different but what he has written about and in various aspects i do not think anybody has done as good a job of that and those specific aspects and i'm not talking about the oh you know the uh, the larger theory of things but there are certain parts of his writings and spirituality which you will truly appreciate once you enter into that zone and you will see that what he's trying to say is exactly how it happened his language may appear a little tough initially but if you can break through that barrier and if you and it's like his reading him is a bit like sadhana actually but remember my path is not his i do not follow integral yoga i follow what i follow yeah but i that's very find, interesting i find some of his writings absolutely bang on accurate about certain inner states that he's trying to say and once you understand that once you realize that your appreciation of the master changes completely that this was no ordinary man okay you cannot write those things unless you experience those things so he may be using a different language his goal is something different my goal is something different but i hold him in one of the deepest uh, respects and i still you know whenever i find time uh, some of his books i pick up and some a paragraph here and a paragraph there i read that apart from him uh, there are you know as a bengali of course i uh, have a deep respect for sri ramakrishna i like ramana maharishi very much i used to Tiruvannamalai was perhaps the only other place where, for a brief period of time, I was almost uh, pulled into the worship, the path related to the holy place of Arunachal, and I had some very nice experiences there. That is why, until I got a clear message from there that I need to, uh, my path is not there at least in this lifetime. I should focus on what I am supposed to do. So um, that kind of a phase happened for a brief period of time. so i like ramana maharishi very much but uh, the figure that i find most inspiring and about whom i know very little unfortunately is the uh, uh, you know the 4th 5th century uh, great nath yogi and master who was known as the matsendra nath so he yeah. is something i find most uh, most inspiring i know very little about him because most of the stories that come to us about him is uh more or less anecdotal stories okay that there was this great great being in fact he is so legendary i believe that he was so fantastic that he has been made into a myth sort of that um, he was born in the stomach of a fish uh, some something like this story goes like this and there was a place called chandradipa somewhere in uh, bangladesh delta area which is currently uh, you know submerged in the sea sort of and he heard shiva and parvati discussing the tantras and he hears it from them and then he comes to the shakti pitha of kamakya and in that place uh, in the shakti pitha of kamakya he uh, sees he experiences what is called the yogini kolo system 
the yoginis of the mother these are uh, these are not figment you know just uh, terminologies the deities who are very close to the divine mother okay each of them has their uh, set of yoginis around them the yoginis taught him tantra sadhana and he settled down in kamakya which was one of the four original shakti peethas in india by the way uh, the 51 peethas that we have today is sort of it came in later on initially the the oldest realm of texts always mention there are four crucial shakti peethas of these four only kamakya is the one that is still uh, you know how to put it in existence or is well known of them so Matsendra from there composes a text known as the Kolo Gana Nirnaya, which is the first doctrine of the Tantric Kolo Sadhanas. Kolo Sadhana is something that is also misunderstood among people, both here and outside India. Uh, but it is also the uh, pinnacle of Tantra Sadhana, to be honest. Yeah. It's like the final stage. The among the various acharas that are there, there are seven acharas or systems of behavior. as uh, the consciousness progresses further as shakti increases and as one goes deeper and deeper and once he reaches the final stage that is the kolo stage of the sadhana and this matsendra single handedly brought the knowledge of the kolo sadhanas from the yoginis to the ordinary plane of humans where people who are capable and who are interested can follow that path so that one text kolo gana nirnaya that is the the beauty of the text is when i was speaking to some uh, scholars about it so they told me that uh, that text was perhaps composed somewhere around 5th 6th century i mean that's a rough guess it could be few centuries before or after something like that because as i said uh, details about matsendra's life is very less known uh, what we have is anecdotal stories about him and the sanskrit that is used in certain places there are grammatical errors in the text which is very fascinating so in that era when somebody is composing a text it is unthinkable that you would have any grammatical error but now look at it this way matsendra's disciple primary disciple was gorakshnath gorakshnath was a hatha yogi he was he was like an incarnation of shiva he was an absolutely brilliant hatha yogi a tremendous expert in kundalini yoga but he was not into tantra sadhana of the kolama okay there are many anecdotal stories where goraksha sort of uh, makes it clear that he will not go into the panchamakara system okay while matsendra was completely kolo gorakshnath and matsendranath from there we have the birth of what is called known as the sabar tantra sabar system of tantra sabar is what non sanskrit mantras that are used to invoke deities and get their blessings so this transition we already see a trace of that in the fact that the kolo gana nirna text that matsendra composes already has certain amount of very mild not very drastic but certain mild amount of grammatical uh, inconsistencies or shortcuts that are taken which a writer in that era would not normally use for writing composing a text okay so i find matsyendranath as perhaps one of the greatest uh, masters about whom i know very little and uh, you know just a wild fantasy but if i had the ability to time travel i'd perhaps like to go back in time and see that how he used to do his practices we even have uh, a master of the kashmiri lineage uh, avinav gupta mentioning matsyendranath and calling him as one of the greatest kolas of the whole kali yuga he's not even saying for you know 10 years 100 years no he's saying in kali yuga there will be nobody of his caliber and he then you know reverently bows to mahakala he is like that yeah so in, there is it's fantastic i mean that is uh, my he is the one i most uh, i find him most fascinating because for an individual to get a vidya from the yoginis and then compose it and give it to the people that requires an a level and a caliber that is uh, that's beyond all parameters it's one thing the self realization is fantastic uh, becoming a great saint is fantastic wonderful thing there but still we have some examples of that this is too rare this is too rare hmm hmm that it's especially a uh, knowledge of that high caliber systematizing it and so yes. rightly so he is referred to as baha kaula and he is not only he is so accomplished that he traverses so many apparently different traditions you know yes. so even he figures yes. in the bauddha path and yes. even gorakshnath figures in the bauddha path that they are mm-hmm. so important mm-hmm. that they are part of the list of 84 mm-hmm. mahasiddhas of the yes. you know bauddha path yes especially in the vajrayana system so okay yes. 
uh, I think the million dollar question that we have received mm. so far, you know, in the number of questions that we have received is one of the top most is how does <coughs> one know who is their mm. Ishta Devata? Well, how does oh, one that... know who is their Ishta Devata? Uh, so this question's answer is uh, it's not that difficult, but you have to understand it clearly in the sense that Initial, there are different people. There's no standard answer to this because there are different people and each individual has a certain amount of uh, samskara from past lives. Okay, So he's coming with, he or she is coming with his or, his or her baggage. So for somebody, the, um, the Ishta Devata will be very clear from beginning. So you have a tremendous love for a specific deity. So most likely that is your Ishta. But there is also a possibility that even though you have a love for a deity, that may not be your Ishta. When I know one specific instance of a very high caliber tantric upasak uh, in North India, I know him. He was a, uh, he had told me this story. Uh, he was a upasak of, he was a Vaishnava upasak. So yeah, he was a Vaishnava upasak. He used to worship Krishna and he used to worship Hanuman. And he was a big devotee of these, these two deities. He used to live close to, um, uh, he used to live close to what you call it, you know, uh, the Mathura, the Vrindavan, no, uh, Vrindavan Banke Bihari temple of Krishna. And he used to visit every day. That was one of his first things in the morning. He used to go there and visit and do visiting and things like that. Uh, once, uh, I think it so happened that his eventually the individual who became his guru, he had come there and he went to meet, um, you know, touch the feet of the guru because he was a famous saint there. And uh, he goes uh, close to the guru and the guru tells him that uh, go to... Uh, uh, go to the Krishna temple once again. So he said that I have been there in the morning. I go there every day. I, that's like the first thing I do after waking up. So he said, no, just go once more. I say, ba, pranam karke So he goes there to do pranam. And he says he goes there. And as if you've gone to Banke Bihari, you'll see that it's kind of crowded. It remains right, you know, where people can stand there in the uh, hall where the deity is on a raised platform. So he pushes his way through the crowd and he goes close to the deity and uh, is looking at it and suddenly sees that instead of Krishna, there is Kali standing. And he thought that he, this is, uh, how is this possible? So he's again, he keeps watching and he's like, he's telling me that he's you know, staring very carefully that he's saying, but there's Kali, there is Kharga and there is a Mundamala and there is everything there. And he is like, uh, stunned, what is, you know, morning itself I had seen the deity and this was Krishna and this was Banke Bihari and suddenly uh, the deity is appearing as Kali. So he comes back again to uh, this gentleman, this sadhu. Uh, his guru, who would turn out eventually become his guru, and says, and his guru starts laughing at him and tells him that you are in the wrong path. Your path is something different. So, and uh, then he says that he had some, so while leaving that one sampradha, it was a bit tough for him because other people started saying, you know, that, you know, you should not do that. If Krishna is the highest. They're all very uh, immature people often digest uh, literally sayings of the scriptures and then, you know, just uh, st keep issuing forth the same sentences without actually understanding the essence and the, you know, the spirit in which they were written. So he finally was in a state of conflict for some period of time, but eventually the pull of the deity was so strong that he left that path. And today he's one of the most accomplished tantric upasats. Many people from far and wide come to him when they have problems in their sadhana and he guides them. He's a terrific individual. But I find the story very interesting. So initially, for a long period, he was quite convinced that Krishna, and he used to love Hanuman very much. So he used to worship Hanuman. So these either of these two has to be the Ishta, he was sure. And then one chance meeting with his guru and everything changed. And um, so finding the Ishta Devata is, it depends on the individual. There is no set path. One easy option is that if there is a, um, at the initial stages, if there is some deity you like, actually, you have a strong connection to, provided the deity is not a very obscure tantric deity or a deity of the cremation grounds, then it is different. But the average standard deities, whether it's Shiva, whether it's Krishna, whether it's Durga, whether it's Ganapati, whether these standard deities. So you start with worship of those. Okay. And if your worship is sincere, if you are, if you carry on and remember this, this thing that Many people start off and then they think that within a few months, why result is not coming. It will not be that simple. You have to carry on for a few years at least. Okay, if necessary, take an upadesham on how to worship the deity. 
uh, increase your engagement with the deity and the deity itself will take you if there is some other ishta devata whom you have to worship who your real ishta is sometimes the path may not be straight it has to go through uh, you know different routes and then leads there eventually you realize your ishta when the deity actually appears in front of you and a tremendous intimate connection with your soul is built that however is a very high caliber experience it doesn't come on day one after that experience happens with the deity then there is no more confusion ever then you know that i was always meant to worship this deity hmm. so this so is how i think this is, yeah that wonderful reflection you know that throws us into more deeper uh, aspects and what i have seen is that you know we keep saying this connection and but we forget often that connection means it's two sides the story is coming yeah. from the two sides and for a yeah. seeker on this path for a predominant amount of time there might be some <coughs> sparks here and there that might come up and give us an affirmation that uh, give us an affirmation that the deity is responding and there is a connection that is forming but however mm. uh, we will start seeing something more uh, unambiguous categorical mm. that the presence and the guidance is just getting stronger mm. in that mm. regard in fact i want to come to the next question is that i i you know often i find one of your examples uh you know very fascinating in this path is that uh like how a young youngster you know and a young individual a girl or a boy you know they they're just fallen in love and they want to find everything about their beloved so mm. in in the current in the current times they might even go on to a facebook profile and stalk them and figure them out and all of that so if mm. something similar happens in the path that you have built up with your own connection with the deity Uh, mm-hmm. i'm not uh, saying that one should really consider the deity as a beloved that's a different thing you know it's always mm-hmm. good to mm-hmm. see the deity as a higher power with whom mm-hmm. uh, we are uh, unfolding our potential mm-hmm. uh, but we should also know and try to know and meditate and immerse ourselves as much as possible in this in this direction so i would want you to reflect that on how how does this does this really take place you know does the does the individual really go about searching to know more and more how do i build and strengthen this connection and if they were to do it you know what are the things that they have to pick and how do they have to go about doing it uh so it's uh once you have decided that this is the deity you want to uh, pursue okay and this is the deity you feel a connection for then couple of standard things you have to do one is that of course you start doing sadhana of the deity something either um, uh, i am not saying that you have to go into complicated sadhanas but there are very simple sadhanas that for any deity you can do one of the simplest things is the stotras of the deity or the nama japa of the deity which is every deity will have a you know the ashtottara nama 108 names so for chanting the ashtottara nama of a deity you do not need anybody's permission you can just start off if you want it is only when you come to mantras and when you come to tantric mantras that you will need at least an upadesham from somebody or you may need an initiation from somebody because those uh, have their own impacts uh, so somebody you know uh, who is more advanced has to guide you in that but to take the 108 names of the deity so you start with worshiping the deity consistently and you keep doing it for years not even months so you take a take a stable idea in your head that you have to to pursue a deity a deity is not like a uh, not like a human being okay first of all it does not have a physical presence it has a very real presence by the way but not a physical presence and it it can manifest as a physical presence it can manifest as a various thing various other things but remember that it is for from our perspective a deity is timeless which means that uh, he or she has existed at a time when human beings in evolution had not even come anywhere okay from that period of time the deity has existed and tomorrow if by some weird miracle uh the earth ceases to exist or for example the human race vanishes let's say it's nothing going to happen to the nothing is going to happen to the deities they will be there they were there they are still here they will be there later also so for them the time scale is very very slow it's not like you know in our human uh, endeavors of things we our life is about 60 years 70 80 or uh, whatever it is a human life span 70 80 years is a blink of an eye for them when it's they don't uh, you know consider it to be that amount of a time 
So in that phase, if you have to build a solid connection with the deity, so what is the aim of a deity upasana? First of all, the highest aim is that you must reach a stage where the deity is communicating with you. It's the way I'm speaking to you, the way I can, you know, I need to ask you something. I pick up the phone and ask and you respond to it. So that state you reach where the deity is interacting with you in that condition. And like a friend, uh, whatever equation you have, like a parent, like a friend, or this or that, etc. And this is going to bring about certain visible changes in your atmosphere, in your life, etc. So remember this, uh, a question may come in uh, that if somebody, a question may come in that how do you differentiate between an upasak who is actually interacting with a deity and somebody who is in a mental asylum and claiming that I can see this and I've seen that. The very simple answer is that if you were to interact with a deity uh, on a genuine interaction if an upasaka has, it will bring certain very positive changes in his, in his, at, in his or her attitude towards life and things and certain manifestation of uh, very powerful, positive strangeness will happen. Positive is the key word. The difference between a mentally ill person and an upasaka is that who is able to see a deity, the mentally ill person is going to go down and down. The situation is going to go worse. And worse means the standard idea of negatives, you know, depression, anxiety, fear, disease, these things are going to increase. A deity, on the other hand, doesn't do that. Deity expands you you will be absolutely, depending on the nature of the deity, you will imbibe some of that nature. Uh, to the extent, eventually, you reach various categories of interaction. Us may be, there are levels of interaction, which means initial stage, you may, suppose a person is very high, he may reach a stage where when he sits for a specific sadhana, whether he's doing his japa or whether he's doing something, and the deity appears in front of him, uh, or makes his or her presence felt, and there's a communication. <coughs> Next higher stage is that you may not have to actually sit down to do the job. When you call the call to the deity, the deity makes an appearance or has a way of communicating with you. Okay. Third, even higher stage, when the deity is not at all separate, deity has actually entered into you and stays inside your mind and body. Then you become this upasaka, the yogi becomes a yantra of the deity. Then that kind of a yogi is the highest, most powerful of all yogis. Uh, that kind of an upasaka, if you meet, then it is as good as meeting the deity because inside him there is nothing left. He is not he is not a human, normal human anymore. So, and it is very rare to find that kind of an individual. By the way, it's not so easy because if somebody has reached that state, he's least likely to advertise it to other people. Okay, so uh, and it takes lifetimes of effort that final stage. But the the aim of this whole process of interacting with deities is that you transcend the human condition and you go into the condition of being like a deity, a god. Okay, so that frees you from things like the bindings that make human life uh, problematic, anxious, difficult, sorrowful. A deity doesn't feel that way. A deity's perspective of things is very different than a human perspective. And one of the simpler ways to just to add one line here in this is that, um, so I like reading the story of Krishna from the Bhagavatam, though I'm not a Vaishnava, only because I look at it from a different perspective. So in the evolution of the avatars, Krishna represents the stage where a god is walking among human beings. You will never find one second in the text where he has any doubts about anything. Why should a god have doubts? He has no doubts. He is never, even when he's running away from the battlefield, it's like a calculated move. So he's sure that he's absolutely confident that, okay, next time we'll get it. And he gets it also uh, in his fight with one of the kings, etc. So here is this thing. There is a man who is walking and there are very powerful characters around him. Each of them very great upasakas, many of them, etc. And this man, right from day one, from his childhood till his death, it's as if there is supreme amount of confidence in him. This confidence is not possible. It's not something he's faking it. It's not something is showing a false bravado. He just knows confidence that comes when you know what is going to happen, when you're operating from an entirely different perspective. That is what a deity does. That, uh, if you realize a deity, you move beyond the human condition into something from a very human condition into a, let's say, a sort of a divine way of, you know, looking at things. But this is not the standard 
perspective in which the story of Krishna is understood by people. This is a perspective which is, if you look at it from an Upasaka's point of view. Okay. So uh, basically, the path with an Ishtadevata or any other deity is that you start off worship of the deity, you increase your engagement with the uh, Ishtadevata, and you have to be very patient because the deities are, take a lot of time. So it's, don't expect a result in three months. So I remember when I started Sadhana, one senior Upasaka told you that if somebody comes and tells you that in this lifetime you're not going to attain anything, are you going to stop your practice and do something else? Uh, I was like, what kind of a question is that? So he said, that, consider it as a rhetorical question. So if somebody comes and actually tells you very seriously, and not joking, tells you that, boss, uh, you can't do anything in this lifetime. You're wasting your time. This is not your path. Leave everything and go do something else. Okay. If you leave everything and go, that actually means you're not meant for it. If you have the capacity to slog through it, even when you see that there is no chance, kuch nahi ho raha, nothing is happening, not a leaf is also moving, and there will be phases in sadhana like that. Initial stage when you enter a sadhana, correct sadhana, correctly guided sadhana, you will have many experiences. Then there will be a space where you will move like a straight line. Nothing is happening. You have to keep doing continuously, continuously, continuously. You may get some experience of the deity, some interaction with the deity very next day, or it may happen after another 50 years. You do not know. Nobody knows. But you have to keep doing. And if you can continue with that kind of a patience, that kind of dedication, that kind of selfless hard work and discipline, then one day or the other nature is going to give you something. And that is where you will go to you know, the next stage of sadhana. So point is, once you, once you decide that this is my ishtadeva, this is what I like, you start worshipping the deity, you find out certain practices, spend at least an hour with those practices and continue for four to five years without break. If you expect a miracle in five days, 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, you are fooling yourself. That's about it. Uh, 15 days, Tashoro, if you expect a miracle in six months also, you are fooling yourself. Even if you have an experience, you will not be able to digest that experience. That's the second part of sadhana. A, having an experience right. of generation of the Shakti, which is easy, relatively speaking. Next stage is digesting that Shakti, which is much more difficult. And the last stage, which is for the only the absolute, absolutely high up, where you actually you have the intelligence and the capacity to deploy that Shakti in various aspects. And that Shakti will be related to the deity you are worshipping by the way. So it depends on the nature of the deity. So these are various things like that. That's beautiful. I think, you know, that has covered so many questions that, you know, which were just following up. <laughs> but, mm. uh, uh, you know, what I, what I really gather from this is you have defined a sort of intimacy and the union and the identity that one starts cultivating with the deity and one starts becoming almost a seamless receptacle of the grace and the presence of the deity that is at a very mm -hmm. high level you know that you have said mm -hmm. and you have also uh, said the steadfastness with which one has to stay the course even when the results are not really arriving that kind of defines the quality of the relationship one is willing to invest into the path and i think one more thing pretty much on the same lines which i you know which i can reflect from my own experience is there is a sort of reliance only on deity that starts emerging that yes. you know that for all head and tail any sort of problem in this life and we continue to commit so many mistakes and That's we know true. that you know deity has got our back that you know this could have been a real disaster but mm. there is something that just lifted us from this, isn't it? You know, that's something that absolutely. I wanted. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In fact, that is exactly what, as you go deeper and you realize that a first realization that a sadhak has is that the deity is not a figment of imagination. There is a big difference between believing in, uh, specifically, mm -hmm. there, are, see, there are two aspects. Most people who come from, a, from our culture, from the Hindu culture, you are taught that there are deities. You accept it as a fact. You may not have seen it actually. You accept it and then there are there may be people who come from a different culture so they will find somewhere in between deep down difficulty in accepting that what is this this must be some kind of and plus if you add some uh, modern age vedanta to it so you, there are i find many writers these days trying to do that kind of linking between so deities are something internal and this and that uh, i am afraid that they their experience in this matter is much lesser it's like you can sit and write about just anything you know who's going to check something like that so once you have the experience of the deity, you realize, no, it is not something inside you. There is something. 
there is a force and there is a being only that it is non corporeal i mean people find much easier to believe in spirits and ghosts than they believe in deities <laughs> this is my experience mm. <laughs> but right. you absolutely once once you once you experience the deity and there is no doubt in your mind that this is not a coincidence this is not a figment of imagination this is something else is going on you will start believing in the deity that belief is very different from the normal belief or normal disbelief both of which starts from lack of knowledge to be honest once you do so that I, hmm. please, please go ahead no you tell me what uh, no uh, sorry ask. for mm-hmm. interrupting your thought flow but that's that's mm-hmm. exactly i was coming to because you know in this in this realm of relationship with the deity another mm-hmm. remarkable thing that also comes across as a question is that we see the nimittas we see the pro, you know we try to see the indications that try to confirm that yes you know this is i am getting the guidance in whatever way Mm-hmm. often people fault often fe- people falter here you know that's the fear mm-hmm. at least people mm-hmm. who do not start on this path they will already mm-hmm. anticipating that what if i am deluding myself mm-hmm. what if this mm-hmm. message and uh, inner message is not coming from this true communication mm-hmm. and so uh, mm-hmm. this is where i feel that there is a certain element of faith that will take precedence over everything else and number two the maturity and the depth of this relationship also helps one refine their perception of the messages and the guidance they start receiving so i just wanted you to reflect on that you know how people can uh, you know uh, really how, how do people arrive at a point of powerful discernment between what is their own self set of self delusions vis-a-vis what they really know categorically that i am getting this guidance so you know this is uh, this is a thing that i've thought about myself for a long time because i have uh, and i'm very very thankful to the great goddess who resides in the blue mountains of kamakya who i consider as my ishta devi uh, for uh, introducing me to all sorts of people in this path so i have had seen i've seen people who are exceptional siddhas and i've seen people seen people who are completely deluded and that delusion also is spread to people who are deluded along with the disciples who are equally deluded so full circus is going on so the world is like this and there is not i am not talking about specifically about uh, sadhana the whole world is a circus and everywhere you will have these things so it's not a big deal uh, but the key thing in this path and for that matter in any path is that always check are you deluding yourself start as the first point of any engagement if you have if you are entering this path with some other secret desire inside and doesn't matter what you say because verbally i see you know when i speak some once in a while i keep getting mails from people or who my those who my guide sometimes uh, so they will start with you know i have this big desires and i want to become spiritually this that etc etc but if you scratch the surface there are various other things that you want so these things deep down what you want what your true driving desire is eventually is what is going to define how far you can go if at all you can go there that is the most important thing and that that itself will become decide eventually whether you will end up being deluded or you will end up into a true relationship with the date that is very difficult mind you uh, do not think that this is easy it's not impossible but neither is it easy uh, number 1 number 2 initial stages when you are doing sadhana it is very good to keep your common sense and your head intact do not give up your common sense completely into believing that oh i am such a uh, this is another kind of delusion that happens you know they start uh, and there is this uh, faith but the depth of the faith has not been reached it is more of a superficial verbal faith so many people i see i mean last one year i was interacting with quite a few uh, people and i had a very fruitful year even though it was covid time and all that um, the i met people who have every drop of a hat they will be ma 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 but if you scratch the surface inside you see that the main core the driving desire is something else entirely they have either i want to become very famous i want to attain some this thing i want this and that etc kuch kuch hai or so where your driving desire is that is where and if you're dishonest about it this is a form of dishonesty your surface mind remember the vocalized mind has the capability of lying and the biggest lies are the ones we tell ourselves okay that i am so spiritual i want i am here because i want this and that etc all the stories will tell 
so if you have the capacity to be honest with yourself and this honesty is something nobody in the world can teach you not even the greatest guru from the himalaya comes in front of you will not teach you that if you are not able to execute that on yourself that uh, absolute brutal honesty with yourself uh, you it's very difficult to fool a deity it's impossible deity is like nature you are the easiest person to fool in this whole equation mind you an upasaka fooling himself is the easiest thing that happens and it happens so often when some experience will happen and think oh now i am so great i have met and you won't believe it in last 10 years i have met at this five to six ramakrishna reincarnated everybody likes to believe some experience they will have that i am incarnation of ramakrishna of incarnation of this and that all sorts of um, fantasy stories basically just to make you self feel better about these things happen when your progress actual progress with the date is less so your mind needs to construct a reality that makes you feel good about yourself these are all psychological yeah. things and the funny part is that in old funny nahi actually the sad part is that in olden times uh, perhaps there were gurus who used to take that kind of interest in the disciple and they would take a very few amount of disciple maybe 5 6 max or 10 because taking a disciple means you are recreating that person from scratch obviously when the person is coming to you he is filled with ignorance he can he or she cannot entertain the same ideas in state of consciousness that he comes in uh, and still progress uh, in sadhana that's not possible and that's another bigger delusions we have so we want spiritual experiences but we want to stay the same at the same time how is that possible so nothing is going to change around in my life all happiness is going to be there whatever i am my friends family this and that every you know full package that is going on is fine but i also suddenly want to become tomorrow ramakrishna paramahamsa how is that going to happen first thing a deity if he comes is going to clear off various things around you and that clearing is always going to be painful you may be thinking this is useful deity may not think this is useful for you and if he or she does not think it is useful and you are calling him he is going to cause some changes and you must have that kind of discipline you must have that kind of uh, as i told you right at the beginning that ability to hang on come whatever may okay it's like uh, they'll take you into a roller coaster ride and your job is to hold on to the deity after the ride settles down then you will see a new reality that is when you are reborn that is when you are a sadhak properly before that you are just uh, mental ideas all that i am very good and i am this and that and this process by the way everybody goes through if you read the kathamrita of sri ramakrishna a man of that caliber man obviously of such a high caliber you can find uh, he also passes through various phases it's not uh, day one that you know suddenly mm. kali comes to him he keeps craving for her he keeps uh, you know there's a process through which one has to go so uh, delusion is one thing one has to be careful of if one is one is constantly checking oneself for delusions there is uh, and also when it's persistent results will come so i think um, we are going to enter into a very essential phase of this conversation which is very practical you know much more, all that what mm. we have discussed have been profoundly practical but they have been very clearly some some specific questions so mm. is is another 15 20 minutes okay for you rajesh that we yeah, can yeah, take that's this fine. Yeah? sure what Great. time is it so uh, i yeah. think yeah so before i pursue that you know since uh, many of them are still here and if they want to you know some of them have some time constraint i would like to make just couple of important announcements at this juncture which are very pertinent for them sure. uh, one is uh, not only this discussion ishta dhyana uh, uh, rajarshi and i will be facilitating a practical retreat uh, in in march uh, 2022 from march 13th to 18th and uh, it's a beautiful time uh, and the right time to come even to bengal if any of you are interested to participate we will make this announcement of ishta dhyana we will send emails we will make announcements appropriately and you can register for that and that that would be focusing on getting to the nuts and bolts of how we take the next step of the upasana worship and how do we take this whole process deeper Uh, another appeal to all of you who have participated uh, that the for the seva activities and the efforts that we do at sanatan siddhashram and also for uh, wonderful conversations that we plan to uh, put up on these lines and these efforts and we would love uh, we would encourage 
uh, we would make an appeal that you make a contribution. Uh, there has been a donation link and a contribution link sent to you via email uh, through this talk for this talk. And there will also be a follow up email uh, to uh, give you a thanks, a note of thanks for your participation and also a donation and contribution link. And your support uh, would only help us do this uh, better. Uh, so I would like to gear back to this conversation we have last 15, 20 minutes and you know get hold of the best from Rajeshi that there are few practical things if you could reflect on the role and the necessity of say a murti or the uh, uh, you know the idol that we refer to as and it's idol is not the right word but the murti which is energized Vigra. form of avigraha of the devata uh, of our ishta devata and how how indispensable how important it is and what are the responsibilities that come around with it it's not easy to maintain that and i would also add to that a question uh, related with should one be connected to a particular kshetra that is the divine center that connected to the ishta devata in order to enhance this process you know if you could reflect a little on that i will take up the last question first because that is uh, pretty interesting uh, and my my experience uh, in this path has been that it is absolutely very very good that initially when you are trying to pursue the person of a deity and you are actually genuinely interested in progressing getting closer to the deity uh, so you do your sadhana at home, say six months or one year, whatever period of time, do it in a very disciplined fashion, which means that suppose you're spending an hour, uh, you did not do 100 things, but choose what is possible for you to do. Make sure that you do it every day, come what may. Okay, so even if you're traveling, you'll still find out time to do that. Say if it's half an hour or one hour, whatever, etc. cetera. Uh, if you're traveling, uh, I've seen people who even when they're sick, when they're not feeling well because of something, they'll, they're not able to sit properly. So they will lie down, but still complete that, whether it's mantra japa they are doing or stotra part, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a specific period of time during the day, a uh, specific uh, sadhana, suppose. And uh, discipline is the first initial step for progress. It, experience is not the first step by then. That's another big <laughs> um, uh, sort of incomplete idea people have that I will do and there is a deity. No, if you do not have the discipline within you, that means you are not increasing your Adhar Shakti. Your capacity for spiritual experience is not increasing. And if your capacity for spiritual experience is not increasing, even if all the gods come and dance in front of you, nothing is going to happen. You will remain exactly where you are. You just don't have the capacity to take their energy. This is precisely what happened when I described to you the first experience I had when I saw the deity in front and I got scared. That's because my mind and body was not at the level where it could take the energy of the deity in a fruitful and positive manner. So I got scared. That's the reaction. Whenever you are in front of something whose energy you can't uh, harmonize with your energy, your reaction is going to be negative. It's either fear or you'll be stammana, which you, that also happens. You'll be so scared that you can't even move your leg or feet or anything, or you'll run away from there, something like that. Okay. So, in order for you to build up something, you have to have that discipline. Absolutely. That is the step one. Number two, suppose whichever is your deity, so I'm, let me talk about the Shaktu Upasana, uh, worship of the Divine Mother. Suppose you are a worshiper of Makali, suppose. Make it a point, at least once a year, go to a powerful Shetram of the deity, Shetram of, go to a powerful Pitha of Kali, whichever, wherever you want. Spend at least five, 10 days there. Do not go with friends and family. This is not a picnic trip. This is not, you know, we'll go there and we'll chat and drink and discuss and whatever. Seen people do that. No, you go there, either you go alone or go with two, three people who are also of the same mindset as you, as sadhats. Do that same sadhana there for 10 days. Do it. And remember, when you do the sadhana at the beginning, make sure that you do a sadhana that is harmonized with the shastras. Don't just invent something out of thin air. That's another, all sorts of things happen today. But follow the Shastras, because the Shastras, the Sadhanas they give are things that have been done for centuries and centuries and centuries, and people have perfected them. So that is why we refer them. Shastras are not something, you know, randomly somebody writes a book and it becomes a Shastra. No. Shastra is something that has stood the test of time for thousands of years, and it has produced tremendously great people. So you know that this is a document that results in something very fantastic. It results eventually in a man like Ramakrishna, or a man like Vamakapa, or a man like Aurobindo, or something like that, or Matsindranath. So that is why we bow down to the Shastras. So follow a path that is given in the Shastras. And 
follow the discipline at least for a year and make sure once a year you visit the shetram of the deity and you do the sadhana there. This pattern is very important. The initial stages, see, it comes back to the same question. Can I directly go to the nirguna? No. Even if you do to self, suppose you're worshipping the nirguna, you'll still need some physical anchor in this case. Your mind and body is just not capable of entering into the transcendental just like that. I'll just do us like this and then my mind will go into transcendental. It's all, it's all mental, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 you Gymnastics. Know, uh, Gymnastics and that again, it's superficial mental gymnastics. It is not something real. So we don't want all that mental gymnastics and all that. We want something very real. Okay. So given that, it is very important that you anchor your practice to some kshetra because these kshetras are have been worshipped for centuries and centuries, and the deity is actually present in that kshetra. So you go there, uh, whichever it is. I mean, I'm not saying you have to go to one specific. So if you are a Vaishnava. You might want to go to a Vaishnava temple. If you're a Shaiva, you found a Shiva temple. Find a Shiva temple that has been in existence for uh, uh, you know centuries and all that. Um, so you go there, you do your practices, and then eventually, as time comes, you will progress. So that is that is very important initially to connect yourself to a Shetra, whatever it is. Number one point. Number two about the Murti Vigraha Upasana. Vigraha Upasana is more complicated. If you have a so most people, what they do is just keep an idol or a vigraham as an object of concentration. This is very different from a vigraham where prana pratishthapana has happened properly, ritualistically properly. Once prana is invoked into the vigraham, then it is as good as the deity. Then your responsibility becomes very high. Basically, if three days if you go, if you have a vigraham where prana pratishthapana has happened and three days there is no worship of it, the deity will leave that vigraham. And there will be certain consequences of it. So your responsibility becomes much higher. It's like if you keep a pet in your house, if you have a dog or a cow or a cat or something, your responsibility becomes higher, right? You can't just uh, leave one day, I'm going to my friends for 50 days. Who is going to feed the animal? Who is going to look after the animal? And this is a deity. So you have to be even more, it's like having a human being, but somebody who is far more powerful and somebody who is a bit demanding also because he's, he or she is powerful. So you need to adjust your lifestyle according to that. Only if you are capable of it, then go ahead. If you are not, then uh, do stotra part and all that. You, it's very simple. Light a diya in front. Uh, keep a photo. Just simple photo is fine. Photo is for concentration purpose. It's not necessarily as a vigraha. Uh, and you do your mantra japa sadhana, whatever you have to do. Hmm. Okay. So uh, the last. Uh... But I know I know we had quite a more, but I think you know we have to uh, mm. thank ourselves for what we have got as much <laughs> and was possible today. But I think more on a concluding note, I would want you to reflect upon uh, the need and what is the role of a practice like meditation can help in this path. So meditation, meditation is useful, but uh, no doubt it's very useful, but. What exactly is meditation? There are so many types of meditation possible. What meditation are you doing? Are you meditating on the self? Uh, like Ramana Maharishi used to say, meditate on who am I? Are you doing that? Are you meditating on the chakras? Are you meditating on the vigraha of a deity? Are you meditating on the form iconography of a deity? Each meditation will produce different results. So meditation is very important. In this path, uh, after you do the practices and specifically after a certain stage is reached, uh, there are certain times of the day when one must meditate on the deity. And if you meditate, focus on the iconography, correct iconography of the deity, and your sadhana is going well, certain energies and properties of the deity will also get reflected in your mind and body. That becomes very important. So this term, when somebody asks me, can I do meditation? It's actually a meaningless term. What type of meditation are you talking about? It's like saying, can I practice maths? Yeah, you can do class one maths or you can do PhD level maths. Which mathematics are you talking about? You can add two plus two, or you can add two negative numbers. Also. Everything is maths. So what meditation are you talking about? What is be the more clarity you have inside you, the more clearly you will reach the goal. The more vague you are in framing your ideas to yourself, because first you frame it to yourself, then you frame it to the world. The more vague is your goal, and the less chance that you will ever succeed in this eventually. And succeed means you should keep Aim is the highest, not a little bit, you know, I'll do some practice, some blessing will come and that will be happy. No, you keep your aim only at the highest so that the good part is even if you don't succeed in one lifetime, nature is going to take care that eventually wherever you are born, 
whatever condition, the deity and nature will again bring back that link to you and you will carry on in your path. Hmm. So I think that's, I know meditation was more from a reflection also that there, I know usually the, the general questions mm. that come is, you know, when I'm sitting for Japa, there is a wavering mm. of the mind and the thoughts mm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I was just trying to look at the meditation as a cushioning practice that would just mm. give more a sharpening to the whole process. Mm. But mm. I think what you have said is already mm. clear that, you know, first define mm. what meditation is in this context and then, mm. I know, come yeah. from that perspective. Everything has so, very clear definition. Actually, people who are at the beginning stages, they read one, two books, they themselves don't know obviously they have not achieved so they have these various fancy ideas of things uh, not to discourage anybody but yes if you have to go deeper you have to be very clear you have to first disengage all the wrong ideas you have in your mind otherwise you'll remain exactly where you are even if you try for a thousand years you will not reach anywhere and these things are very brutal but this is exactly how a practice eventually develops into something more concrete something tangible and something beneficial eventually the harder you are to yourself the greater is your chance of success. That's a perfect note to register for, <laughs> for this conversation. And that's wonderful. The harder you are to yourself, the honest you are to yourself. Yes. And uh, I know building no uh, castles in the air and just trying yeah. to be very open to yourself. Mm -hmm. That's where mm -hmm. we are. That's mm -hmm. where we begin. From. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Rajesh. I think this was a fantastic exchange. And uh, I mm -hmm. think there is still so much more left out. If uh, mm. there is appetite for you and me, and we will discuss, and then if we see there is a room that we should mm. share further, and we will mm. definitely mm -hmm. put this across, uh, you know, as another possibility. But again, to remind everybody, a couple of things. And first of all, thanks a lot, Rajeshi, for mm. this wonderful mm. time that you have taken mm. and been with us. And it's spent oh, more than one and a half hours. Mm. And uh, we really cherish. And this particular mm. talk, recorded will be uploaded uh, for the you know uh, information mm. for all the participants it will be uploaded on our online akhada please do mm. visit and you can always access this uh, mm. and you can uh, register when we make an announcement whoever is interested mm. you know send us mm. your you know interest for uh, coming mm. and participating in the mm. retreat we will be practically conducting mm. and helping uh, you know each other to reflect and uh, move forward in this path of ishta dhyana and ishta upasana mm. connecting with one's own ishta deity mm. and uh, last but not the least i uh, encourage all and i appeal to all that please do contribute please do support so that we make this more uh, more possible with that note joy guru guru kripahi kevalam and then Saraswati Mas Krupa for tomorrow and then Krishna thanks a lot for making all the technical glitches vanish in no time and Joy Guru there thanks a lot Rajesh Joy Ma Joy Ma. Okay.